great pleasure to introduce our speaker of today, Julia Rohrer. She holds a bachelor, a master and a PhD in psychology from the University of Leipzig. And she's currently part of the personality psychology research group. She also appears to be a great chef, having recently written the causal cookbook. And given that another one of her papers is called The Only Thing That Can Stop Bad Causal Inference is Good Causal Inference, we know that she has an aptitude for punchy titles, which make which is further confirmed by her talk today, uh, which is Causal Confusions Correlate with Causal Conclusions. So it's our pleasure to have you here, and the stage is yours. So thank you for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. First of all, I have to apologize for the extremely vague title. So this is just what happens when you um, agree to send a title before you've actually settled on what you're going to talk about. So what am I going to talk about today? So I do want to talk a bit about the status quo of causal inference. And I am going to focus on psychology. That is because that is my own fear. So I feel confident in throwing shade on research practices there. I wouldn't want to talk bad about public health in this audience. Um, but I hope you will notice in my talk that there might be parallels to other fields of research. And I'm very much looking forward to your input in the discussion. So maybe you can tell me later on whether this applies to your field or whether I'm completely off and there are important differences that I'm missing. So I do want to talk a bit about how causal inference is currently taught in psychology. And then I do want to talk about some select confusions that result from this way of teaching causal inference. After that, I want to ask like, why that's the case. Why does it look like that? And how we could potentially um, improve that. So if you study psychology, most likely you will learn the following about causal inferences. If you do want to draw causal in inferences, you either run an experiment or you just give up. You don't, because there is no other way to draw causal inferences. And in psychology, this also, I think, goes back to the um, history of psychology. So this is um, Wilhelm Wundt in the very first psychological laboratory founded in 1879 in Leipzig. So this is very salient in Leipzig. Everybody thinks they are in the tradition of Wilhelm Wundt. And this is like the prestigious tradition in psychology. And that is not um, the only way the field could uh, think of itself. For example, in philosophy, people have thought about human minds, or there's the tradition of psychoanalysis, but really the prestigious thing is experimental research. Wilhelm Wundt did physiology, physiology. So this is the tradition in which people like to see themselves. And so what you essentially teach people is you need to do research that looks like this. You need to run controlled experiments, and that's it. That's all there is to learn about causal inference, which is, the same as saying like actually causal inference is not taught in psychology. It's just taught that you should run experiments instead. So I think this leads to a lot of confusions that are visible in research articles in psychology. And I'm actually going to start with the experimentalists here because um, I think it's neglected to think about how that hurts experimentalists when they don't learn any systematic approach to causal inference. So first of all, and that's more like an observation, um, I have the impression that experimentalists in psychology don't quite understand like how good randomization actually is. So there seems to be that like misunderstanding that randomization is just like a way to guarantee that the groups are as similar as possible on some covariates. So the idea is that this ensures covariate balance. And then ever so often, somebody will discover that actually that often doesn't hold and the groups are different on some variables. And that means randomization does not work and experiments are broken. And so I think that's not unique to psychology. I think that happens in um, epidemiology as well. And as you might know, um, this is like a misunderstanding because randomization is not about balancing all covariates because if you've randomized, all differences in covariates are by definition random. So it is about randomness and uh, there are nice articles trying to explain that. So there is more like a side note or an observation. I think more troubling is that there's a certain excessive belief in the magic of randomization. So the logic goes like this. You have an experiment because you randomized one thing. And so this means this study is now an experiment. And that means that all causal claims can be justified by design because you did an experiment. And that means something got randomized. Now, this extends to all sorts of claims. So for example, there might be the idea that claims about moderation are always um, justified if you did a randomized experiment. And to give you an example of what I mean with this, 
So when psychologists talk about moderation analysis, they are thinking of a scenario in which you have um, some independent variables, some treatment, and then you investigate its effect on some outcome. But what you're interested in in particular is how these effects are modified. So for example, given that I'm a personality psychologist, I might wonder whether the effects of some stress reduction program on subjective well-being depend on people's neuroticism. And so the common practice here would be to run a randomized experiment and then just measure neuroticism and calculate an interaction term and check whether that is significant. And if the product term of treatment and moderator in the analysis are significant, we conclude that there is significant moderation. The effect of the treatment changes depending on neuroticism. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, we've actually only randomized one thing here. We have only randomized participation in the stress reduction program. So we can causally identify the effect of the stress reduction program. However, neuroticism has not been randomized. And so actually we do have to think about other variables that might affect neuroticism and they might also affect the effects of the treatment. For example, a plausible confounder here would be gender. We do know that there are um, fairly replicable gender differences in neuroticism. And now it's entirely possible that for some reason, the program actually works better for men than for women or the other way around. And this could result in a certain type of confounding, like a confounded moderation. We may conclude that neuroticism actually modifies the effects of the treatment, when in reality, it is probably just gender and eroticism just uh, happens to correlate with it. So of course, if this is our causal model, then we could think about, oh, well, okay, so we need to control for gender and its interaction with the program and so on. But that is usually not what happens when psychologists analyze moderation. They just look at the interaction term. So there's an important distinction that can be made here and that might be familiar to some of you. So on the one hand, we can have something that is a causal interaction that is indicated by the arrow so the moderator has an effect on the effect of the treatment. But there's also another thing we can observe, and I call that correlated heterogeneity. So we just observe that the effects vary, and that variation in the effect is correlated with some third variable. So um, in epidemiology, there are different terminologies for that. That's something I learned when I wrote a paper about interactions. So you might call it interaction versus effect modification, or you might call it causal effect modification versus surrogate effect modification and so on. In psychology, it's actually, there isn't really terminology for that. So there are individual papers that try to introduce the distinction. So they, some papers will talk about moderation as opposed to statistical interaction. And then other papers will talk about interaction as opposed to moderation. And it just gets kind of confusing. And it's just like an indication that psychologists actually aren't very good at distinguishing between these concepts because they don't have any like really model of causality and what happens when you randomize something and what happens with other variables in your model. And so one indication of that is that we wrote a paper on that. And afterwards, a lot of people told me, oh, that's really interesting. I never heard about that differentiation. And those were like established people doing great methods work in the field, but who had never heard of that distinction, which I think is kind of more, uh, more well-known in public health. So that's the one part, claims about moderation. And it extends also to claims about mediation. So in mediation analysis and psychology, the idea is that you have some usually randomized treatment and that affects the outcome, but you also assess some mediator and that is usually supposed to be some psychological process variable, maybe some internal process that does mediate the effect. So it transmits it as part of the causal chain here. So the Routine practice here is you did a, an experiment, you manipulated the, the um, treatment of interest, you measure the mediator, and then you run a standard mediation analysis, which just involves these three variables. And if there is a significant indirect effect in that analysis, then the manipulation affects the outcome via the mediator of interest. Now, what's the problem with um, this type of logic? Well, again, we have a situation in which something was manipulated but we're interested in something else that has not been manipulated. And here it's the mediator. The mediator will be affected by the manipulation, but it will also be affected by other variables. And so actually, if you want to make causal mediation claims, we do need to think about potential confounders. And the ones that have to worry us here are mediator outcome confounders. So those are all variables that affect both the mediator and the outcome. And so if there are such confounders and they aren't modeled appropriately, and what will happen is that we will misestimate this particular path here. 
And because the indirect effect is a combination of this path here and this path here, we will get a bias in our indirect effect. We can get something like spurious mediation analysis. Now, this is actually a problem that has been pointed out by experimentalists in psychology as well, albeit in a maybe a bit convoluted manner because they often lack the causal background to actually spell this out in like a proper formalized manner. But um, it's really a persistent practice. So this still happens a lot and it's getting a bit better. And more papers get <laughs> desk rejected now because they do this type of thing, at least in scenarios in which not even the treatment was um, randomized. So um, in experimental research, we also see confusions about mediation. And then if you combine the two, you also get um, confusion about moderated mediation. So this is something that was quite fashionable in psychology for quite some time. And it's just a combination of the two. So you have a mediation chain, but it depends on some moderator. And as you might imagine, that requires even more assumption for causal identification, because now you need to worry about multiple moving parts at once. So those are the um, confusions on the side of the experimentalists. So on the one hand, it's, it's a bit of a lack of appreciation for the magic of randomization, but then it's also a bit of an excessive belief that if you randomize one thing, all claims are warranted afterwards. But of course, there are many psychologists who actually do non-experimental research. And the way we teach causal inference puts them in a bit of a bad spot. Because first of all, virtually all interesting research questions concern causality. It's when we want to theorize or when we talk about applic applications, we do need to draw causal inferences. And at the same time, observational data are not admissible for causal inference. But now imagine you are in a field of research where you can't easily experiment on people or on the variables of interest. For example, imagine you were a personality psychologist. How do you deal with that? Well, you could change your job or move to a different field, but um, you could also find some nifty workaround. And um, there's one particular workaround that I observe a lot in at least my field of research, and it's a particular style of article. So it starts with an introduction that relies on a causal reading of the literature, because that is what you need to tell a good story. The methods and the results are never explicitly talking about causal inference, but there may be maybe implicit, implicitly causal inference. What do I mean by that? A researcher might talk about how X predicts Y, even after accounting for all these other factors. Maybe X is a risk factor of Y. I think that's one that you also have in public health, where it's kind of unclear what precisely is meant by that. And then we do have like longitudinal associations or maybe even lag effects. This is followed by a discussion that only makes sense in terms of causality. So the discussion only makes sense if we had established a causal claim. But then it's super important that, you, that one paragraph that your study was only observational and no causal conclusions are warranted at all. However, future longitudinal and experimental studies will fix this problem, right? Because science is a process and uh, future studies might fix that problem. So what this style of article does is it sets up a particular type um, of defense that one might call a modal Bailey. So you want to live down here in that nice little village where you make the claim that X has a causal effect on Y. It's very much what your paper implies. It's the whole reason why it got published in the first place, because people really aren't that interested in associations only. However, if a critic takes a look at your work and says, oh, well, wait, your data were only observational and you're drawing these causal conclusions, then you have a strategic retreat. You can just say, well, I did write that X predicts Y. I never said X is a cause of Y. And look, I have that limitation section that you should not interpret it causally. So actually, it's your fault if you misread this particular part of the paper. And um, so this setup makes for very, very frustrating um, scientific arguments. And I've gotten into too many of them. But in any case, I think it's not a good state of affairs if you set up this type of article that can't be refuted because it claims to do something else than it does. There are many variations of this. So I just brought um, some of you, of some of them for your entertainment. So for example, I'm a personality psychologist and we do like to talk about incremental validity. And that's the idea that you have an outcome that you want to predict from a particular personality construct. And then you include other predictors in the model. But if the coefficient of your construct of interest remains significant, then you can claim incremental validity. And you can say, oh, my construct has um, added predictive utility. And of course, that's usually interpreted as a causal effect, but it's never quite explicitly spelled out in that manner. Um, another one, and now I have to throw shade in another field of research, but I think another one here is functional connectivity. 
So this is essentially about high dimensional correlations in the brain in intensive time series data. And it is essentially a correlation of a special type. However, the name functional connectivity does seem to apply something else. And there's a very nice paper that essentially documents how it's usually interpreted as something causal, even though it's not essentially, it's not always warranted by the data. But it's one of those things where you can easily say, oh, no, no, it's just functional connectivity. We never made causal claims. But of course, they were interpreted causally in the article. Um, I think another nice example of those confusions in that Weasley language can be found in the longitudinal data modeling literature. And so there is a nice paper by Ellen Hamaker who um, makes a very um, sensible point from a causal inference perspective that certain type of longitudinal models should include random intercepts. And that's a good thing because that removes some um, confounding by unobserved variables. But there is a very interesting footnote in that um, paper, which I only noticed when I read it for the second time. So the footnote sa says, while the omitted variable problem implies that we cannot make strong causal statements based on correlational data, it does not prohibit the use of the concept of Granger causality. However, many researchers using cross-leg regression refrain from using the term causal and use terms like reciprocal relationships, role, cross-domain effects, exposure, impact, or influence instead. It may be argued, however, that these alternative terms also imply a causal mechanism, and even more so that an interest in causality is actually, driving the, is actually the driving force behind these studies. Therefore, we decide to use the term causal and causality in the current article, although we, uh, although we acknowledge that strong causal statements can only be based on experimental design, and we should confine ourselves to the concept of Granger causality. So um, that's a very convoluted footnote in there. And I think it's a nice, it has that nice thing that it first of all lists all these terms that actually just say cause in a different manner, but sound more, uh, I don't know, more fancy poo emoji. <laughs> and uh, additionally, it also clearly shows that the people working on longitudinal methods, me methods in psychology don't want to own causality. It's not their business thinking about causal identification. They are doing statistical modeling. And so a big focus in the longitudinal data modeling literature is on disentangling between and within person association. And that is treated as the central analysis goal. So this is why we have longitudinal data. And so the between person association or between person effects, that is something like people who spend more time with their friends are on average happier. And this is usually considered not causal, which is good, but sometimes it's interpreted as causal as well. That is when your personality psychologists are very motivated in interpreting differences in a causal manner and differences between people because that is your field of research. And the other part is within person associations. So this is something like on a given day, if you spend more time with your friends than on other days, you happen to be happier. And so these effects, these associations are thought to inform us about within person processes. And this is essentially what is interpreted as the cause and effect here. So what's the problem with that particular framing? Well, the problem is that these within person association can still be confounded by time varying confounders. And so to give you an idea of um, what I mean here, I brought you like a graph. And so what you can see is two time series. For example, X could be the amount of time you spent with friends over the days, and Y would be your happiness on those days. And so the longitudinal data is actually quite helpful for causal inference because it does allow you to model like stable inter-individual differences and correlate them. Um, if you know the idea of fixed effects models, that is essentially the psychologist version of this. So you're only looking at variation within people. However, even within people, there can be confounders. For example, it could be that you only go out and meet your friends on days where you are physically healthy. And so this could be a confounder that affects both your well-being on the day and your happiness and the time you spend with friends. And so usually these possible within person confounders are just ignored in psychology. Instead, people just run the model with the two time series and hope that they can interpret um, the within person associations in a causal manner. And so just to give you examples from other fields, that is not just psychology that is doing this. So um, in climate science, there is that idea of teleconnections. And so these are es essentially correlations across a large distance. And one example for that, that is probably quite um, well known is El Nino. So you have like a change in sea temperature in one place, and then something happens at another place, maybe rainfalls and so on. And so 
these teleconnections, again, are often just thought of as something statistical. So we have a correlation here in climate variables. But of course, they easily lend themselves to causal interpretations. And I think it's quite recently that in climate science, they start to adopt a more explicit framework to causal inference. So for example, there is um, an introduction to causal inference for climate scientists by Marlene Kretschmer, who is a professor for climate causality now in um, Leipzig. And um, there are excellent groups in Berlin working on climate causality. But it's still like, it's, it's just a small, small part of the field. And there is actually like a whole field that is called attribution science that is about explaining why extreme weather event events happen. But in that field, there are many people who claim that they are not making causal claims. They are only like telling how the variance can be explained. They are not trying to tell like you why something happened. I mean, they're trying, telling you why something happened, but just in a statistical manner, which I found quite fascinating to learn about. And last but not least, there is, of course, also health research. And uh, so there was a large scale language review by Noah Haber et al. And I was part of that where we looked at um, health studies and the language that was used to describe associations. And it was quite interesting to see like how many ways people come up with to describe some sort of statistical association that manages to imply causality, but still maintains like a certain degree of plausible deniability, which I think is extremely important in health research because there are even journal guidelines that state that you're not allowed to talk about causality if your data were observational. So. You might have read by now. <laughs> I think this is a bad state of affairs. So I think one problem is that, so there's a confusion about the purpose of the analysis. Are we doing causal inference? Are we doing prediction? Are we doing description? And I think that necessarily leads to worse analyses because there are right, like the right tools to do prediction, but they are not the right tools to make causal inference. It's just different approaches that require different tools. And in my experience, people use the wrong tools and the wrong statistical analysis because they are not quite certain about what they are actually trying to say. And then it would be nice if all that, like being Weasley about causality, provided um, some protection against inappropriate causal claims. But I don't think that's what's happening. So first of all, the causal claims are going to happen. If they are not explicitly in your study, some media reporting might pick it up and interpret it in a causal manner. I know that people like to blame the media for these things, but I actually think the articles are written so carefully in a particular way that they can be interpreted causally. So it's also guaranteed that the next study that will try to write a causal introduction about a topic will cite the respective paper as evidence for the ca causal effect. So it doesn't really matter whether you're like really careful with the language or not, it's probably still going to happen anyway. So why are we in this um, mess? At least in psychology, I think a big Part is lack of training. I mean, in particular, that we don't train people in causal inference at all. But I have to say, I don't think it's the whole story here. And so I brought a quote. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. And so I do think that actually for psychology as a field, it's actually a convenient state of affairs. It works quite well. So first of all, we can stress the scientific nature of our field. You all know that correlation does not equal causation, and we mostly do experiments, so it's all good. We are doing rigorous science here. And then everybody still gets to draw causal conclusions all of the time, whichever way they like it. So if you're an experimental psychologist, you will just randomize something, and then you can make causal claims about everything else that you measured. And as a non-experimental psychologist, you just try to pretend something else that is not causal inference, but then still draw the causal conclusions because that's the only way to interpret the data. And it's actually, it's just kind of really nice. Like in psychology, you can build very complex causal models based on um, observational data. And I think you can make claims that you wouldn't get away with, for example, in economics or in public health. You can just say, oh, that's my model of reality. And uh, sure, it's not causal, but the model fits the data and so on. So um, I think it's, it works for our field. Um, I think it's bad for science, but it's kind of like um, functional. And I think it's also maintained by the fact that psychologists tend to be rather agreeable people. So unless you explicitly say, oh, this correlation quantifies the causal effect of this on that, the people will just be like, oh, well, no, I mean, he didn't quite say causal, right? So maybe it's fine. And I think the dynamics here are very different from, for example, economics, where people very much enjoy taking each other down. 
So in psychology, it's more like oh, everybody has their small niche, everybody has their own psychological construct and so on. And we all do the kind of not very causal causal inference. But it's, it's kind of fine and we are all friendly and everybody gets to publish a lot. So we do publish a lot in psychology. And um, I think that has the effect that even in the top journals in psychology, you will get very bad causal inferences. And I think that is not something that happens in economics because they do more intensive gatekeeping, which of course also comes with its own cost. So how can we, how can we improve that? Well, I already said training is part of it. So I do think we need to improve training, but I'm mostly thinking of terms of we need to equip future reviewers and editors to be better at filtering this. And so I think for the next generation of researchers, so those are the students that we're currently teaching, um, I think we just need to rethink how we teach statistics and methods in psychology. So right now, and I'm, I'm guilty myself, I'm teaching such a course now in Leipzig, but there's a super strong focus on statistics, and it's mostly statistics to compare means between groups. So maybe you have two groups, maybe you have three groups, maybe you have four groups, and then you just walk through different ways to compare groups, and that is like statistics too, essentially. And it is very much um, geared towards making causal inferences in experiments where it's kind of trivial to pick the right statistics. Not always, but it's easier than in observational research. And so I think we need to change something about that because it just doesn't match the nature of psychology, which is in some part at least observational research. And um, so one thing I think is important that we need to start with clearly defined estimates when we teach students. So we need to be more explicit about what the purpose of a study is, what are we trying to find here? So it's not, we are interested in comparing two group means, now we are interested in identifying a particular causal effect in a particular target population. And of course, we do have to explicitly teach causal inference frameworks, potential outcomes, directed acyclic, acyclic graphs. Um, I feel like in psychology, the directed acyclic graphs work very well because we have the structural equation modeling tradition. And it's also something that I think first year students already kind of love because it's kind of intuitive, it's quite easy. And in my experience, it works quite well. And it's a great way to teach the next generation. When it comes to established researchers, I'm always slightly less optimistic. And that's just my experience because many people have built their careers on like misinterpreting certain numbers. Um, but what I found what works quite well, so there is a fairly new um, methods journal in psychology. It's called Advances in Methods and Practices in Psychological Science. And it's essentially, it's not really a methods journal, it's like catching up with methodological developments journal. So it's a journal article, you can read it, you can cite it as an established researcher. It's not embarrassing, like citing a textbook, but it is kind of basic introductory articles. Um, and I do think that is like one way forward to actually get the causal inference to the established researchers who probably think they already know everything about causal inference. Um, apart from that, I do think we need journal level interventions because in my experience, psychologists can get pretty good at causal inference if they are forced to do so to get published. And so um, one way forward, I think, will be specialized editorial roles. So um, this is Simin Vazir, and um, I don't know whether anybody of you knows her, but she has been super active in the open science and reform movement in psychology. And as it happens, she's now the um, editor in chief of one of our most prestigious journals, Psychological Science. And now what she has started is she has added a new editorial role. It's called a star editor, statistics, transparency, and rigor. And they assist handling editor editors on an ad hoc basis. And I can tell you what that means because I'm one of those editors. So we have a slack and the editors are like, oh, there's a paper here that reports a mediation analysis. Can somebody just check this part of the analysis? And I found that to be like extremely productive because we have like a large pool of people with all sorts of expertise and it's super easy to find somebody who has the right expertise to address the problem. Um, apart from that, and that's something that I noticed when um, working on that language health review, so I think psychology needs structured abstracts. So currently we have these narrative abstracts that go up to 250 words where somebody just talks about theory, talks about implications, and it's not quite clear what the paper is actually doing. And um, so when we, when we coded those health uh, studies, I noticed how easy it is to code the um, structured abstracts. And then in between, there were some like econ or psychology abstracts. And it was just a nightmare figuring even out what the supposed exposure was to be in that paper. So um, I think structured abstracts might be a great tool. 
And I'm thinking in terms of actually having an, an estimate included in the abstract. So there's an estimate section. It's not just a research question, but it's the quantity that we're actually trying to estimate here. So there could be a causal effect. It does not have to be a causal effect, but it needs to be explicated. And then on top of it, um, I think it would be really helpful if people spell out their identification strategy. So this is something that I already see ha happening in economics, where they have that narrow focus on um, identification strategies. Um, uh, but I think something like that would be helpful as well, just like state explicitly. So what has been randomized? Has anything been randomized? Which confounders are taking into account? Which assumptions go into the analyses? And so I've written more about that um, proposal in a blog post, which you can read up on if you're interested in this. And last but not least, and this is more of a meta point, um, I think that is interdisciplinarity can be quite helpful. And there's actually a paper that explicitly makes that point by um, Paul Smaldini and uh, Caitlin O'Connor. So what these authors do is they make a formal model of how science works, and they have a model in which reviewers are biased towards the methods prevalent in their own field. And I think that's a very plausible assumption, in particular because the reviewers are also authors in their own field, and so if everybody profits from making um, kind of bad causal claims, then reviewers don't really need to do anything against it. They, why, why would they, right? And so um, this reviewer bias can entrench bad methods within individual fields of research. And now actually breaking down all disciplinary boundaries wouldn't necessarily fix that, because in that case, bad methods could get stuck across all fields, and that would be very bad would be like a very bad um, situation if everybody does the same thing wrong. However, what they then model is a model where there are distinct communities, but there is interdisciplinary contact. So for example, there are peer reviewers recruited from other fields of research for their particular expertise, or people occasionally go and publish outside of their field, maybe to spread new methods. And um, in that model, they do find how that like entrenchment of bad methods becomes less likely because there's like new methods coming in. And so I do think that is actually already what is happening with respect to causal inference, because causal inference, which is now like becoming more established as a field in its own right, is highly interdisciplinary. So um, from that perspective in particular, I would now be super interested in all of your thoughts and comment, comments. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.